Britishness. I do appreciate that it makes it quite difficult sometimes for people to understand me, especially because I don't understand the concept of slow. I have never understood the concept of slow. Um, so if you can't understand me, just stick my hand, your hand up and say, you are getting incoherent, McCarthy, stop. And I'll try and track back and, and, and be less incoherent in future. But the other thing is, once I hit my stride and start riffing, it's worse than a very drunk comic at a late club night. So if I get there and you find I'm going way off the point and I start bringing in small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri or your president, feel free <laughs> to stop me. Because um, really, a talk is all very well. I mean, I love what I do. And I would do this if nobody read my books. I would do this if nobody invited me to conventions. I would do this because I'm a writer, but I'm also a historian and a researcher. And I can't not do this. But obviously, a talk without an audience is nothing. And it's not, or it shouldn't be, me talking at you. It should be a dialogue between us. Not that I expect you to engage me in conversation, although you're welcome to try if you think you can stop me for 30 seconds and get a word in edgeways. But I want to be responding to what you need to know. So if you have questions, feel free to ask questions. We'll have space for questions at the end. But if you, have some, if you hear something that sounds like a complete non sequitur or that you can't see where I'm going, give me a few minutes to see if it emerges, because it's a bit like a mystery. It's a bit like an Indiana Jones adventure. Things emerge through time. Give me a few minutes, and then if it still hasn't emerged, say, hang on, five slides ago, you said we were going to talk about X, and I'm still waiting. That's fine. So we are approaching. I take it everybody can hear me. Good. This is a wonderful microphone. I picked it because it's orange and short. And therefore, it kind of works for me because orange is one of my favorite colors. And I am very, very short. Um, now, can we, is there any chance we can level off the slides a bit? Because they're, they're kind of drunk at the moment. And for anything to be drunk at 2 in the afternoon and not to have taken me to the bar is just insulting. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And there are, there are going to be things that they will need to see. So we need to get all the slides on. If you go up till we get the white, white border. A little bit more, a little bit more. Brilliant. And then if, what, if that right-hand side can come down a bit, that would be perfect. Cool. Thank you. That would be superb. Can you all read what's on the board? Great. Yep. Are we sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. That's how the BBC used to start a kids' program called Watch With Mother that I watched when I was tiny. Are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. As this says, the really early history of Japanese animation. Anybody like to hazard a guess when anime began? Mm -mm. Back, back, back. Well, no, and I'm not sure why it says in the description it began before the 20th century, because uh, it, it didn't actually, not in Japan, although animation did, but let us move on. And first I'm going to tell you, because this is my first time at Anime Fest, who I am and what makes me qualified to talk to you about this with some kind of authority. And historians always say some kind of authority, because a good historian knows that their authority is only as good as the thing that nobody's dug up yet that makes them look really, really stupid. Looking stupid is an occupational hazard of all scholars, but it's a particular occupational hazard of historians because we will say, this definitely happened, and then someone digs something else up and says, no, it didn't. So humility is built into the study of history. If it isn't, you're not a good historian. I've been wrong about this period at least three times in public, in print, spectacularly in my scholarly life, and I love it. You know why? Because every time somebody gets a little bit closer to the truth, to the facts, to what really happened, we all gained. And I'm going to tell you a lot about a great scholar who's brought us close to the facts and who isn't me. 
funnily enough. Um, but I've written 13 books which have been translated into eight languages, including Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. In Japan, I am now described in professional circles as a Samu Chesakus biographer, which is quite a feather to have in one's cap in the country where he was born. And I've spent a long time studying anime and manga and playing with anime and manga because to me, if it's not playful, it's no fun. But history is, is both a serious academic discipline, and I was taught by good historians, and an Indiana Jones adventure. Um, Jones is a rubbish archaeologist, by the way. Anybody who's seen an Indiana Jones movie knows that he completely destroys the context of every artifact he digs up. And to historians, the context is more than the artifact. But to museums, treasure seekers, collectors, the artifact is what they pay money for. But we need the Indiana Jones sense of adventure. We need that willingness to go into snake-infested pits to get closer to the reality of history. And we need to be willing to say we're wrong. I don't know whether any of you have heard of a great British historian called Mary Beard. Fantastic woman, great feminist, which puts her in my book, but also a fabulous historian. And she made her career name very early in her career by writing a book about the Vestal Virgins of Rome. And it was a great book. It was a good read. It was a fantastic story. It was full of information about the Vestal Virgins, which was the best they had when she was 25. Recently, in her early 60s, as an even more renowned historian, she's turned around and said, actually, most of that book was wrong. But what it did achieve was it got us thinking about the Vestal Virgins. It got us tying up other elements that we hadn't tied up before. And so by being wrong, a historian makes it possible for other historians to be more right later. We're constantly standing on each other's shoulders, and that's what matters with history. As you can see, that huge fat book there on the table, the yellow one, that's going to be my tombstone. Actually, it's heavy enough to be my tombstone. It weighs 2.2 kilos. Um, you can kill somebody with it if you hit them hard enough, although I haven't actually proved this yet. Um, it is the Anime Encyclopedia, which I co-wrote with a protege of mine who is now a, a professor and a distinguished academic in his own right, called Jonathan Clements. Because when I started out in anime, I wanted a book that would tell me everything that would tell me who wrote things, who directed things, who designed things, what the story was, any interesting snippets about them. And believe it or not, when I started out, although the internet existed, there was no broadband, there was no Wikipedia, and that book did not exist. So I was privileged to write the first book in English on Japanese animation, but it wasn't that book. Because nobody would buy that book. Everybody said, this Japanese stuff, it's a passing fad. It's really not gonna catch on. I pitched my first book for 12 years before I got someone to publish a very tiny, very cut down beginner's guide to Japanese animation. I went on pitching that book until 20 years after I started, I got to do the first edition. And we finally built to that big fat 1,100,000 word third edition. Who knows where we're going to go from here? The knowledge of anime that existed in the West when I started out was there. The knowledge of anime that exists now is there. If we all keep going, if we all keep studying, if we all keep being enthusiastic about it, the knowledge of anime, by the time we get to Anime Fest 40, will be through the ceiling of this room. We are building up treasure for the future with everything we explore, everything we discover, every thought we exchange, every idea we exchange. Does anyone know what Sturgeon's Law is? Ah, uh, Dr. Hairston does. Do you know with confidence enough to state it? Aha, my astrophysicist professor friend, you are wrong. <laughs> Sturgeon's law is different. That is Sturgeon's revelation. It's a revelation that 90% of everything is crap. You know, where was this guy living? Had he been in a monastery all his life? Actually, T T Theodore Sturgeon, Ted Sturgeon, was a science fiction writer and a very good science fiction writer, but he was also a great critic and a great scholar. And he did say 90% of everything is crap, but Sturgeon's law is more important for historians. Nothing is ever absolutely so. You think you have the monopoly on truth, justice, in the American way. Not even Superman has the monopoly on truth, justice, in the American way. It just don't happen. So as historians, we need to keep 
Sturgeon's law in mind while we're looking for evidence and Sturgeon's revelation in mind when we're reading the crap historians write. So the question I've already asked, what was the earliest anime? Most people who know about these things and care about these, these things will say Oton Shimakawa's 1917 movie, Mizuko Imakawa the Doorman. And they will largely say this because Jonathan Clements and I told them so in all three of our encyclopedias. We say it because Shimakawa, who directed the movie, told us so. We are all wrong. The difference between the movie that was first screened, that is shown in a cinema, and the, or in a cinematic screening, and the movie that was first made is quite significant, as we'll see as we go through the story. But why does it matter? Why does it matter when Japanese animation started? Well, it matters because as you move further back from 1917, you come towards the currently accepted start date of animation, which is 1906. Now, in 1906, a Sheffield-born immigrant to America called James Stuart Blackton premiered a theater act, a sideshow, in which he made animations on a blackboard. And these were photographed and filmed and shown. And so the first animation is widely accepted as being J. Stuart Blackton's Curious Phases of Funny Faces, which is a blackboard animation. The earliest animation in the world, as far as we know, was this. And so America has claimed bragging rights for the invention of animation for over a century. But, of course, ignoring the fact that they're claiming bragging rights to the work of a British-born animator, excuse me, my country, um, we also don't know about other countries at the time, or we didn't until recently. Now, if this date holds, then animation was invented in America. But what if this date doesn't hold? So we start asking ourselves, what was the earliest animation shown in Japan? And for a long while, Jonathan and I, and we've studied anime more seriously than most people that I know, thought it was this. Phantasmagori, made in 1908 by Emil Cole, and shown in Japan in 1914. Now, if you think about it, people can make huge intellectual leaps, but when you're a country that hasn't had much in the way of technology until the Americans and the English and the French stormed in in 1855, 1860, you have to actually know there's a possibility for that technology to exist and then get the raw materials and get the patterns going before you can make it. So, 1914. It wouldn't be unreasonable that clever Japanese could see something in 1914, start working on it, think, this is pretty cool. Could we make this and set up the infrastructure by 1917 for the first Japanese-made animation to appear? That would work. Well, Jonathan and I now also know we were wrong about coal, and it's thanks to this guy, Frederick Litton, a Canadian-born German ancestry scholar who is not only fluent in Chinese, Japanese, German, French, and English, but is also not merely a historian of anime and animation, but also of film technology. And that's the important key. Remember, anytime you're looking at history, history tends to be technology driven. The technology that enabled people to make stone axes drove Neolithic man into warfare and expansion. The technology that enabled people to develop steam trains drove the first immigrants across America to the West. California wouldn't exist without technology, and that's without Silicon Valley. Frederick researched all these because he had a unique skill set, and he has shown us that we were wrong about Emil Cole. In fact, his website, um, litten.de for Deutschland, includes an awful lot of early research for this book, which you can read for free anytime. He actually had to self-publish this book. It's the single most important work on early anime in my lifetime, including mine, and I don't say that often. And he had to self-publish it. He couldn't get a single publisher interested because nobody thought that anyone would buy books on early anime. This is available on Amazon. 
I suggest that you get it or ask your school library or your college library or your public library to get it. It's mind blowing, both in terms of how it sets out the proper historical research method and how it opens up that very early period of Japanese history for us. So this is what it turns out was the first animation shown in Japan. It's an Emil Cole again, but it's an earlier one. It's 1911, and we believe it was shown in 1912, as fast as that. It was out in Paris, and within eight months, it was out in Tokyo. Because, of course, there was a lot of commerce between Japan and the West in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Japanese were frantic to buy all these fantastic Western novelties, and, of course, the West was frantic to sell to them and take out loads of Japanese goods at rock-bottom prices to sell at higher prices in the swanky department stores of America and Britain and France. In a film sounding very like this one was screened in Tokyo. Um, at first, we thought in 1909. And the historian, historian Yoshiyama Kyoko wrote about it in 1933. So we've already got a, a knowledge gap appearing there. A guy in 1933 writing down what he thought he remembered happened in 1909. You know how easy it is for him to be a few years off in the date? Lytton sat down and read through all the surviving Japanese movie theater listings, film magazine reviews, and other material for 1909 to 1912, and finally established that Yoshiyama misremembered the date, but got the picture right. So I'm pretty sure from having read in that book how Frederick did the research, that this was the first animation shown in Japan and that it was shown in 1912. Now remember 1912, it'll get more and more interesting. But the earliest Japanese animation wasn't shown in cinemas at all. This is it. It was found in 2005 and Lytton presents very convincing evidence that it was made around 1907. Now just think of the political delicacy of that statement. He has no evidence for when it was made except documentary evidence and technological evidence. Were he to say this was made in 1906, it would mean that it was made six years before the first animation was screened in Japan, Therefore, saying Japan originated animation independently of Western cinema. If it was made before 1906, Japan originated animation independently of any other animation nation in the world. So I think that Lytton has been scrupulous in scholarly terms and said, I can't prove that big grandstand marquee claim, Japan invented animation, America, get over it. So I'm just going to say around 1907 and wait to see what emerges. But let's go back to why he thinks that. Now, the magic lantern was one of the toys that flooded into Japan from the West and was hugely popular. And this, in fact, goes all the way back to the Netherlands. A guy called Christian Huygens originated the magic lantern in the Netherlands in 1607. He could project pictures onto a wall with light in 1607, four years after Elizabeth I of England died. Quite a few years before the Mayflower sailed to get to America, he could project pictures. This is something. But his invention was obviously refined massively over the years, and the Germans and the French became particularly expert at making magic lanterns. And apart from the technology to grind the lenses, they were cheap. You just threw them together out of tin. So they could be packaged as, admittedly, not street urchin toys, not dirt cheap toys, but toys that a middle class family could relatively easily afford. They were all the rage with trendsetters and early adopters in Japan in the 1890s, who, like the latest video device or like the latest download device or the most, mo most high-tech gaming device today, people who could acquire the best magic lantern had swank rights over their neighbors. Oh, yeah, that model's pretty good, but would you like to come in and see ours? We just got it shipped from Europe last month. It's, it's, it's uh, suburbia run rampant. But it really was the TV of its day. 
And you can see from this box, the whole family sitting. And it's so simple that your daughter can operate it. <laughs> Technology for the masses, indeed. And of course, everybody was riveted by it. And everybody wanted more and more slides. When magic lanterns were sold, they were sold like this rather lovely set that, that came on the market in Europe last year with a box of slides of various different images and different impressions. Pictures of, of schoolgirls in sports. That was a really common theme early on. Hentai was, was running in the very early days. Before anime, there was hentai. Pictures of uh, famous people. Pictures of great civic events, ships being launched, pictures of quaint buildings in foreign capitals. People would have all these and they would show them to their friends. And of course, eventually, you'd get bored with your slides, so you'd want more. But also eventually, you picture it, you're sitting around your living room in Tokyo in 1902. And your neighbors are all seen all your magic lantern slides. So you're just leaving it to the kids and you're all sitting, kicking back, having a glass of tea, enjoying the evening. The kids want entertaining. This set shows us what happened next. Those three film strips on the bottom are not originally film strips. They were originally glued into loops because some clever person came up with a gizmo that would run a loop of images through a magic lantern, making it a film. And this had certainly happened by 1900. It was certainly being imported into Japan well before 1905. So you could put a strip of loop film on that would run for 5, 10, 15 seconds. The adults would watch it, say, wow, isn't this foreign technology great, and go back to talking about whatever they talked about. The kids, as you all know, if you've got small children, they love repetition. They would sit and watch it for hours on end. And so these film strips became really popular. You can see there, there's one of a guy diving off a, a diving board. And any of you who've got a five-year-old will know that particularly if you insert a pratfall at the end so he does a belly flop rather than a good dive, kids will watch the guy diving off a diving board for three quarters of an hour without getting bored. So these were big business. And it didn't take long for the Japanese to realize that instead of just importing new slides from Europe, they could provide slides themselves. And so here we have the Matsumoto fragment. A guy called Naoki Matsumoto, who is a researcher in Osaka, went to an estate sale, I believe you call them, house in Kyoto where great granddad and great grandma had gone and the family were finally clearing out. And he bought a box of magic lanterns and assorted slides. Most of the slides were from Europe. This strip wasn't. Now, at first, we all made, all historians who got excited about this, made a ton of mistakes about this. We thought it was a strip cut from a film. We thought it was drawn by hand on the, the celluloid. We were wrong. It's stenciled, and Frederick Lytton was the person who did the work to say, look, you can see it's stenciled. The red is moving out of register with the black line. You can also see it's stenciled because... This is part of a mass-produced toy set. Nobody makes a stencil to cut one film. There had to be more of these, possibly as many as 100 or 150, because if you look at the analogies of stenciling with Japanese stencil printing, a stencil that's cut for stenciling kimono fabric can be used at least 100, 150 times before it has to be recut. So there could have been 150 copies of this film floating around when it was made. And if there were 150 copies of this film, you can bet your life there were 150 copies of maybe 150 more films. Why? Because there was money in it. Because families wanted to buy new films so that the kids would carry on playing with the expensive magic lantern that they'd invested in. So it was made as a toy. The first animation made in Japan wasn't screened in a cinema, or even in a shopping mall, which is where a lot of animations were screened, or a public building. It was made as a toy because there was a niche for a manufacturer selling Western imported goods to make probably a few sen, which was a tenth of a yen. Remember, the yen had a very high value back in the early 1900s on each of these by getting them stenciled in a workshop. Think of what we've lost. Think. This is the only survivor yet we still might find some more. 
Look at the hat. See how it's moving. You can see, if you look at the bottom of the hat in the upper frame, which would have been the third one to go through, how the red has moved up. It is very, very definitely and very, very clearly a mass-produced artifact. And therefore, this is the first anime ever made. And we think it may have been made as early as 1907. Obviously, there are scholars all over Japan working their socks off to prove that it, or something similar, was made two years earlier would do. So what was the first anime ever screened? Well, again, Lytton explodes this. Musako Inabashi the doorman, Imakawa Mizuko the doorman, was thought to be the first anime ever screened because Oten Shimakawa, who made it, had a reference in his autobiography that indicated that. That's all we got. We got one guy saying, I made the first anime ever screened and it was about my manga character because Imakawa Mizuko the doorman was a, a manga character he had created and it was screened in 1917. But what Frederick did was look through all those sources, all those newspaper sources, all those film magazine sources, as many as he could find. And what he found was a reference in January 1917 for a screening by Tenkatsu, one of the film distributors in Japan, at their cinema club venue in Tokyo. And the sources at the time note this was the first screening of a local animation in Japan. Notice they say the first screening. They don't say this was the first anime ever made. They do say this was the first anime ever screened. And it was an Imakawa Muzuko anime, but it appears to have been an anime about him getting into a tangle with a wild boar, which was quite possible in Japan at the time because a lot of it, even on the outskirts of Tokyo, was still very rural and wild boar was still very common. So again, I was wrong in my assumptions and in how I read the sources I had at the time in that had I gone back, had I had the language skills to go back, which I don't because Japanese has changed quite a bit, to read all those sources and the patience and the time to read all those sources, I would have known that it was a different anime by Shimakawa. Freddy found that out. This is how we know, this is how we know anything. We take what we think we know, we test it against all the available sources, and most importantly, we test it against all the available sources in its original language. There are a lot of great scholars doing great work on anime all over the world, but if they only work on anime as translated into their own language, they are never going to get a proper picture. If you can't do primary source work, you need to make alliances with other scholars who can. We've got no images of any of Shimakawa's work. We've got no evidence for how it was created, although one of his assistants said that he used the chalkboard method, like Blackton had done, drawing on a chalkboard, photographing, erasing, making a new drawing, photographing, erasing. But we, we are pretty confident that this information about the 1917 screening was right. So we can establish that 1917 was the year that domestic animation first had a public screening and that January was the month and that Oten Shimakawa was the guy. It's now corroborated by somebody other than him. And there's actually been a lot of competition about that. Shimakawa had a long and substantial career of about six months. And the reason for that was technology. Anime that's made on celluloid, so we know he must have worked on celluloid at some time, is made on a multi-plane camera, which essentially is a stack of transparent layers on each of which a cell is laid. Bright light is shone through them for even illumination, and they're photographed from on top. The bright light that was shone through the crude cameras of the day was very damaging to eyesight and Shimakawa didn't have the best eyesight before he started. Within six months, he had not only wrecked his back by bending over his light table nonstop, but he'd also endangered his eyesight. So he left making anime, 
He went back to manga. He was a critic. He taught, and he lived a long, happy, and successful life with very, very few people even remembering that he had been the innovator who did the first anime ever screened because his two contemporaries who were racing him to be first were better publicists. This is the oldest Japanese animation we own, the oldest one we have at present that was screened in public. And this is called Namakura Gatana by a guy called Junichi Koichi, a very well-known artist at the time. Everybody in animation at the time was either an artist or a mangaka. They just transferred their skills. And this was also discovered by that man, Natsuki Matsumoto, who discovered the Matsumoto fragment. He went into an Osaka junk shop and he picked up three rusty old cans that looked about the right age to hold films from the early years of the 20th century. And he found three films in there, one of which was this. It was, in fact, a toy film, a toy film slightly longer than the version that we'd had in the Matsumoto fragment, but made to run through a Pathé Baby or a similar projector. It had been sliced together from the original theatrical cut. But with this and with other fragments surviving of this film that showed up later, we were able to put together something approximating the original theatrical cut. And the other person who was... Uh, very, very interested in being held to be the first and greatest Japanese animator was Seitaro Kitayama. Kitayama not only wrote copiously about his work, but also bigged himself up at the expense of his two competitors. He knew that Shimakawa had got out of the business, so he was able to um, imply that he was kind of cooler than Shimakawa and had a much greater output and was technically better adapted. Koichi was doing okay, so the two of them had a rivalry. There was so much misinformation flying around that it's very difficult now to disentangle it till Lytton. Because this guy in this book gives you a month-by-month -month screening list for every surviving piece of animation shown in Japan in 1917, 1918, and 1919. He's essentially read every surviving cinematic source and made a concordance of all the screenings. Now, in some cases, as you probably know if you read reviews, have you, you ever had that experience of reading a review of a movie you saw and wondering if the reviewer saw the same movie or was even in the same theater? Well, that happens in, in Japan. Movie reviewers are a weird breed, especially in the days before the internet when they had to actually physically go and see the movie in the theater. Um, they usually see three or four movies a night, maybe 15 movies a week. They probably forget which night they saw them on. Their notes are made in a darkened theatre, scribbled at speed, and they don't always have time to revise them the same day, so their notes can be a bit deceptive. It's not uncommon to have a reviewer, even today, confuse the plot of one movie they've seen with the plot of another movie they've seen the same night, or think that they saw a certain movie on the 19th when they actually saw it on the 23rd. So all of the, the notes in Lytton's book are riddled with inconsistencies like that, with people giving different titles because they were showing things under different titles because, you know, if you're a small cinema on a small street in Tokyo and you have to show the same movie they showed around the corner last week, what are you going to do to get people in? You're going to give it a different title because at least when they've handed over their 10 sen and they're in the cinema, they might walk out, they might complain, but you've got their 10 sen. So lots of confusion, but this book shows us a way to begin to get through it. But an interesting thing happened. Fashion is fickle. Entertainment is fickle. Japan loved animation until the 20s. And then there was a sudden slump in public interest in animation. Kids had gone off toy films long before that. Kids had moved on to the next big thing, which was fights and cutscenes from their favorite samurai and Gekiga, cut out, uh, Gekiga movies cut out and made into really interesting little short films. Animation was old hat now. They could see their favorite actor actually slashing his sword around for real. The public went off animation as film got better and better. And so many surviving features were cut up into toy films like Nakamura Gatana and all over Japan. And the same thing happened in many, many countries. People were looking at their archives and saying, this is costiest money to store. At least if we chop it up into little films that will run on a Pathé Baby or a home projector, we'll get a little bit back. How many classics of Japanese cinema have we lost 
because nobody had the foresight to store them. It's really quite a scary thought. But it does mean that all of those little films, little toy films, little loop films, went out into houses all over Japan to kids who thought they were cool for a short while and were then put in the attic. That means we still have a chance of finding more of them. Why don't we know more? That's a question that everybody asks me now. I mean, I had a long debate on Twitter a few weeks ago with a, a lovely young guy who was saying to me, you know, you have no excuse for getting things as wrong as you did in your early work. And I said, okay, I respect what you're saying, but I don't need an excuse. I was working on the best information I had at the time. I never claimed it was all 100% accurate, and I've improved as time's gone on. Yeah, but people like you are stopping people like me from writing better work. Well, excuse me. When I started out, I had to beg publishers to print my work. Now you can go on the internet, set up a blog, and you can have 10,000 readers in two weeks. Nobody is stopping anybody from publishing anything today. There is no excuse for not getting your truth out there. But the reason that we don't know more about what happened in 1905, 1906, 1907, through to 1920, is that. 1923, that's Tokyo. It was leveled. Now you think about it for a minute. Tokyo was the center of the film distribution industry. All the major archives of all the major companies, all the cinemas with their boxes and boxes of old promo material that nobody gets around to throwing out in the back, all the newspaper offices with their archives of reviews and of screening adverts, you want to pick them out of that? Good luck with that one. That's why we have so little material to work on. And that's why scholars all over Japan and all over the world are working on salvaging every scrap they can that emerges from those times, from attics, from garage sales, from estate sales, from wherever you can get them. Every now and then, people take off Western wallpaper and find that to save money, instead of underlining it with paper, your grandmother or great-grandmother got your grandfather to put newspaper on the walls. Every time that happens in a, in, in a decoration scheme that's gone back 60, 80, 100 years, that newspaper will still be legible because of the type of paste that they used to use. So every time somebody looks at a wall that was wallpapered in Japan in 1920, they might find treasure under it. We have so much cool stuff to discover. We just don't have the evidence yet. Yet is the best word in history. Yet is so full of possibilities. We can find it. We can go out there. Natsuko, Natsuki Matsumoto might walk into another junk shop tomorrow and find a treasure trove of films that will tell us more, that will do more. Anyone might go rummaging around an estate sale. If any of you go to Japan, for God's sake, go into every junk shop you can. Look for every bit of evidence you can. And if you don't know how to look after it, or how to conserve it, bring it back here or take it to other specialist groups in Japan who will. But you could be uncovering history. We need more. Researchers always need more. Historians always need more. We're greedy. For us, the past is still continuous. For us, the past is still alive. There are still things happening in the past that we have not yet captured. And so we need more research. We need a lot more research. I need you guys to go in and research the history of anime. I need anyone who's thinking about it at college, thinking about a subject in high school that they could take forward to do that. I need anyone who's thinking about a master's thesis or a doctoral thesis to think, could I work this into my interests? Because there is no such thing as too much research. You get deadlines. And you have to send your stuff in before you've done all the research you want. That's inevitable. But there's always time and room for more research. We need more interdisciplinary scholarship. If Lytton, like me, had known nothing about the technology of early European film, he would not have applied it to the technology of early Japanese film. So we need to talk to scholars across disciplines. We need to talk to linguists who understand how the language has changed. We need to talk to cultural historians who know what magazines were around at the time, what papers were around at the time. We need to talk to technologists. We always need to remember 
that history either follows technology or is led by it, but history is never independent of technology. We need more discoveries. We need more Indiana Jones. He destroys context, but my God, he brings home some shiny stuff. And shiny stuff is what gets the public enthused about history. When Tutankhamun's tomb was opened, and that was a model excavation done with great care, but the public sought shiny stuff. Young Egyptian king with gold face mask. Mummies, this is so cool. And the public got so excited about Egyptology that people are still raving about it 100 years on. So we need shiny stuff. Never denigrate the people who discover shiny stuff. Just try to persuade them to let someone photograph it and measure it in situ before they pick it up and take it away to be sold to or stolen by Nazis or whatever they're doing with it. And that's the thing that scholars need more than anything else. And any scholar who tells you they don't rely on luck is lying. It's not the only thing we rely on, but we need sheer dumb luck. We need the sheer dumb luck that led me to meet a guy who said, oh, I've just been to Spain and I found all this stuff, but guess what? It's not made in Spain, it's made in Japan, and started me on my lifelong career. We need more people walking into junk shops, finding amazing stuff. We need all of that. Lytton's excavation work, Matsumoto's educated luck, have brought us to a stage where we now know, with reasonable confidence, that animation began to be made in Japan around the same time it was made in America. And we are just waiting, just waiting, to see what discoveries will be made in both countries. Best kind of arms race. We are racing for knowledge. We should be doing more of this. Thank you very much indeed. Does anybody have any questions? No, not at all. Um, I'm not, as you probably gathered, I'm quite scatty and I'm not, I'm not a scientist by education. But um, if, you if you would like to jot down the details and give them to me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, no, I'm afraid I don't. So sorry. Anyone else? But I look now that you've asked me. Well, one of the good things about doing something like this is that people will ask me a question that I can't answer. And questions you can't answer are the greatest gift a scholar ever gets, because then you go out and try to answer them. So thank you for that. Yeah? Um, it's, part, it's partly fashion. I mean, y you look around the hall today, um, and most of the costumes come from what is currently fashionable. Um, because, you know, we're, we're all human, we're all magpies. And also, young people who've grown up from the age of nine to the age of 15 with the kind of technology we have today, and the kind of storytelling that we have today, don't always really engage with older anime that maybe tells a story more slowly or maybe is in black and white, or maybe is a bit clunkier in technological terms. But there's also the style factor, and I'm glad you described it as the animation style, because, of course, every artist in the world has their own animation style. And if you look at deliberately retro anime, like, say, The Incredibles, um, or properly retro anime, like Astro Boy, you'll see a dissonance between those styles, again, because technology allows Brad Bird to work in ways that weren't open to Osamu Tezuka. Tezuka would have absolutely loved CGI animation. He would have been eating it. He would have been, oh, the, the, the Astro Boy he would have given us if he'd had CGI, that would have been something. But I, I, I think that a lot of the time, when you're in school, I, I was lucky, I was taught history by a very intelligent, very fearless old nun who just gave us history because she loved it, and actually told us, if you're not going to pay attention, get out of my class. I have no time to waste on stupid girls. Um, so I got the love of history early, but a lot of people are taught history badly. And so when they hear the word history, or old, attached to a subject that they love like anime, they kind of shut down on it, you know? But that's all right, because as long as they stay engaged with anime, 
I believe that sooner or later we're all led back to the source of the thing we love, just out of interest, just to see where it came from. And so I think that even though a lot of modern anime is very different in style from the anime of the immediate post-war era or the pre-war era or the very early years, there's still a thread there that links them. And sooner or later, an anime fan who stays with anime will go back there and have a look. And if they decide, you know, this is just old stuff, I'm not interested, that's fine. We don't need everybody to watch black and white silent movies, as long as those of us who love black and white silent movies can. That answer your question? Good. Any more? Well, firebombing Tokyo wasn't exactly positive for historical archive, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It, it was, it's, it's strange that um, one of the interesting things is if Kyoto Animation had been operating back then, uh, they would have got away with it because a committee of American scholars supported by their international colleagues made very strong representations to the president and the US Air Force not to bomb Kyoto. They said this is an international treasure. Not so far. Oddly enough, Osaka, which was another city that was very badly firebombed, has so far been richer than Kyoto. But that's accidental. I mean, Kyoto stayed untouched through the war because of its, its reputation as the cradle of what the West saw as the best in Japan. You know, the spiritual, cherry blossom, tea ceremony, plinky, plinky music, nice stuff, as opposed to the sword swinging, ritually aggressive, proud of its nationality, nasty stuff. Um, but no, the, the, the war was, the Second World War was obviously a major influence. Anything that didn't go in the Kanto earthquake and didn't go in any of the periodic Tokyo fires was quite likely to go in the Second World War. But on the other hand, by then, because modern communications technology and the railways had helped remote areas of Japan to catch up a little bit in fashionable terms. A lot of the stuff that was created in Tokyo before the Kanto, before the war, had gone out. You know, people ordered things in catalogs just the same way Americans who lived in the plains of Alabama used to order from the Sears Roebuck catalog twice a year. People in Tokyo would order the latest entertainment, the latest books, the latest news. Uh, but so would people in the far distant north in Akita Prefecture. So we still live in hope that there are survivals, but in a country that's prone to earthquakes with a building system that's prone to fires, hope is a little more tempered than in somewhere more geographically and politically stable. Any more? No? Well, thank you all very much for being here. That's my schedule for the rest of the convention. I hope you'll come and see some of the other things that I'm talking about. And remember, with everything you see this weekend, if you like what the speaker does, if you like the type of subject they talk about, please let the convention know. Because the main way to make sure that they keep doing programming you like is to tell them what programming you like. The main way to make sure they get the speakers that you like back is to say, I really loved speaker X, please get them again. And I've, I've not been quite so shameful this time because I'm just selling Lytton's book rather than mine. But um, through my future presentations, I may just happen to mention little things that I could do if they ask me back next year. So if you like the sound of that, you know what to do. Thank you all. Actually, I can